and Dan Roth, the executive editor at LinkedIn. Um, yeah, really look forward to chatting with you guys uh, in in preparation for our media summit panel next week. Uh, I think that you know it's really interesting that you. We see all this content being created on social networks. These platforms have huge potential to become the new publishers. So you guys want to start, start out just talking a little bit about what each of you do um, at your jobs and kind of what forming content strategy for, uh, for a social network is like. Sure. Um, so I started a Tumblr when did I start Tumblr? Eight months ago. Um, and I came over from Newsweek where I was doing kind of traditional news magazine writing and editing. And mm -hmm. so what we've done at Tumblr is we've launched a site called Storyboard that is essentially kind of the online news magazine of Tumblr. So we are telling narrative stories, we're reporting on trends, we're doing video and Q&As with all sorts of folks who are using Tumblr in interesting ways. And then sometimes, you know, we're doing pieces that are really just focused on narrative journalism that relate back to the creative community in some way. So the challenge for me is finding interesting stories that can reach a broad mainstream audience, but also somehow relating it back to Tumblr and the Tumblr community. Dan? And I'm the executive editor of LinkedIn, so in that role I oversee uh, LinkedIn Today, which is our social business news product. Um, it uses an algorithm and editorial support to look out over a million publishers, see what stories they are um, writing about, and filtering uh, the stories based on what professionals are reading them, um, who's sharing them, what are they, what kind of uh, signals can we pick up, and then we get the right stories in front of the right professionals at the massive scale. Um, I'm also uh, leading our efforts in our launch of what we're calling internally the influencer program. We just did something recently where we have 150 top thought leaders now broadcasting on LinkedIn. They're writing long form, using a new long form uh, tool that we have. They are followable. There are folks like uh, Richard Branson, the president of the World Bank, uh, Jim Young Kim, Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, um, some really incredible names, the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, the head of the FCC. And they're posting regularly on LinkedIn talking about areas um, of interest to professionals around the world. Um, so both of these areas, third party, incredible third party news that makes people better what they do every day and the kind of information and articles um, and, and voices that will help you think through what makes you a better manager, leader, uh, employee, employer, how can you become a better professional, try to raise the entire business world up. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the influencer program has been really interesting to me uh, as our CEO at Mashable, Pete Cashmore, is also a part of this. You know, it's been interesting to see him work on it um, and really have a new avenue for thought leadership. So what, I mean, what was the inspiration behind the influencers program? And given that it was rolled out to such a select group of influencers, how did you choose those folks? And, and you know, what, what do you think this means for kind of the future of the publishing strategy on LinkedIn? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> so why we did it? Um, for most of LinkedIn's existence, the company was really about uh, or, or focused almost exclusively on the idea of making, allowing people to connect with other people in a professional way. That LinkedIn would become your central hub for everything going on professionally. The last 18 months we've really pushed into the idea of connecting professionals with the insights that matter to them. Things that make you smarter, that make the entire business world smarter. I joined LinkedIn about a year ago from Fortune. I was the editor of Fortune.com, and before that I was a writer at Wired and uh, Fortune and uh, helped start a magazine called Portfolio at Condé Nast. Um, my entire career was all about the idea of getting the right intelligence to business readers. LinkedIn has a way of doing that at a scale that's never existed before. Um, and sometimes the right news is, the right information is are, are things that people are writing about. Externally, sometimes it's taking the third party, it's taking the, the middleman out of the picture and allowing someone to talk directly to his relevant audience or her relevant audience. Um, right. 
So that's the idea. Now, why do we go after these particular thought leaders? You know, the, 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 what we want to do is make sure that we have an incredibly high quality experience. That when people write, it means you have to listen. Um, and we operate at incredible scale. We could have either taken the publishing um, at scale or said we will allow you to allow a small group to broadcast at scale. We went that second route instead so that we can make sure the quality stayed high. We are expanding it, um, but we're expanding it slowly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So I think, you know, one thing you said there that, you know, I find to be the best part of both LinkedIn and Tumblr getting into these content ventures is you've reached out to people who are creating really good content and content with utility that makes sense for your users and that really helps them to, you know, understand something that's already of interest to them. So. I think that one thing that's interesting about Storyboard, Jessica, is that you guys are like creating your own content, but you're also looking for freelancers at the moment. So what what's kind of your criteria for the people who help create Storyboard, and you know what what is that trying to be, and how do you make sure that it provides the best utility for the Tumblr community? Um. So let's see. What are we looking for? Well. You know, we're a staff of three, so it's myself, Chris Money, and Sky Dylan Robbins, who does a lot of our video content. But we're publishing a feature piece a day, so that's a lot for for three people who are also running other things as well. Um, so we're always looking for for story pitches and for ideas and for innovative things that we can be doing in other realms. But um, you know, we've worked with a lot of journalists, so. All of the content we create on Storyboard is original. You know, we're doing all the writing, we're doing the video production. Um, they're feature stories, but they're feature stories that are highlighting the ways that people are using Tumblr. So while we have at times, you know, we have an election blog right now where we chose three members of the Tumblr community to actually cover the campaigns for us. Um, and so they're doing a lot of curation and they're doing some original reporting. But it's not trying to be a platform for professional journalists. So that's our election blog where we've tried to engage our community. And then we've got another site called GIFWitch, which you may have seen over the last couple of days because we've been live GIFing the debates. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, we, we found a few of our users who are big in the GIF realm and who are creating these really yeah. amazing animated stories about what's happening in the political conversation. So we look for a lot of things. It's hard to describe storyboards sometimes in our, in our mm -hmm. editorial platform just because it's like a mixed salad. <laughs> there's, you know, there's some serious content and then there's a lot of fun things like raisins or grapes or, you know, whatever. Like, <laughs> you know, um, so we're really, you know, Tumblr was created as a platform to help creative people and so there are writers and photographers and artists and media people and you know sculptors like every kind of person that you can think of is using the platform. So we like creative ideas, um, and and we try not to limit it based on kind of the parameters of what you might have in a traditional outlet. While at the same time, right. we want our content to be appealing to a mainstream audience, not just to those who are kind of internally um, following Tumblr. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, and how much of your content is short form versus long form, and is it, you know, things that you're you're trying to get to, you know, quote unquote, go viral on the web, which is of course kind of a thing now in terms of sharing, or like what what exactly is the goal with it? I guess. I mean, the goal is really just to produce content that we think is cool and interesting and that we're proud of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't have any real parameters for the, the mix of long form versus short form. Most of our features tend to be in the thousand word range, but we also do a lot of video. Um, you know, photos are obviously very important on Tumblr. It's a very visual platform. So we think really strategically about how we're going to art every single story, just as you would in a magazine. Um, but, you know, we've done a little bit of everything. Um, we've written today, <laughs> today, there's a funny example. We have a story about. Cumber bitches, which is <laughs> what? Uh, on the internet who love 
Um, Cumberbatch, who's the star of the Sherlock Holmes series. Um, in oh, And so okay. they've created this whole kind of fandom community within Tumblr, and they call themselves Cumberbitches. So it's kind of just a fun trend story, a feature piece. It runs at about a thousand words. It's, um, it's arted with a gif of Cumberbatch uh, in real life, like coming out of I think he's taking a scarf off. Um, and yeah. it has been reblogged 21,000 times today. So, wow. you know, we couldn't have predicted, we didn't really do anything in particular to try to make this go viral, but it's a topic that clearly inside the Tumblr-verse people are interested in, especially teenage girls who love this guy. Um, and, and so it's done really well. And that's kind of, the you know, on the one extreme. On the other extreme, you know, we've, we've produced pieces with NPR and WNYC that are kind of a little bit more highbrow and less mm -hmm. wacky. <laughs> yeah. Right, and I mean, I think that that's one thing that any publisher on the web would tell you is, like, sometimes it's a total crapshoot as to what's going to take off and as to what isn't. Um, so, Dan, I'm curious, like, what type of content you've seen succeeding just in this, you know, first month of the influencers program and sort of how is that going and are, is the community receptive to it? So, we the exact same thing, we, we do all this cumber, cumber bitches stuff. What is it? Cumber what? bitches. <laughs> yeah, we just do a ton of those, and they're they're killing. No, the, the, kind of, the kind of material that does really well on LinkedIn is any kind of articles about leadership, um, stories about there was a uh, there, there have been incredible posts about the things to say when you're giving a presentation, about how to not make hiring mistakes. Um, there was a post that went up today saying. You're out there collecting followers and likes and comments, and guess what? None of those are going to show up when you die. Those are not the important things in life. People respond uh, incredibly well to these type of stories. We know there are certain things that do really well on LinkedIn. Um, stories about technology, stories about leadership, anything about management, the economy, all these do very, very well. Um, so there was a post today about, the, um, about high tech jobs filled up with comments from people talking about the visa problems in the U.S., how hard it is to get a job here. That's the, the kind of articles that, that do well, whether they are by uh, Mashable or Business Insider or Forbes, Fortune, um, and they do really well when they're coming directly from one of these influencers also. Uh, what's interesting, too, is to start seeing some people who are using it as a mechanism for, um, for talking to other people in their community. So, there, uh, Marcus Samuelson, the chef, is using it to talk about what kind of food should you eat before, you know, or, or questions around, um, he, had a, he had a great post about eating when you're unemployed, and the idea of how important food is, and low cost, low, low price food is, especially for people who don't have jobs, and the idea of if you're not eating well, basically, you're not going to be able to perform, you know, well enough to get a job. That's not the kind of story. What, what's fascinating about this is we never would have predicted yeah. these were the kind of things that would have done well on LinkedIn. We didn't know. Yeah. We reached out to these people because we knew they had really important things to say, but we weren't sure what 175 plus million people, how they were going to respond to it. And, um, and it's fascinating to watch what trends and what doesn't. Yeah, and yeah, you know, for me, I feel like it's kind of liberating in a way because Tumblr's bottom line is not what we put out on storyboard. You know, there's no ads on our site. And ultimately, the product is Tumblr itself. It's a blogging platform for people to use. It's not storyboard the editorial site. So in a way, that gives us a lot of freedom to not have to worry about how many clicks we're getting or how many ads we're hosting on the site. We can just do really good content that we like, and we can kind of take some risks. And maybe it doesn't work out, but that's OK. You learn from it, and you move on, and you keep experimenting. Um, and one thing that's been really interesting on Tumblr and I think in other realms is that there's almost been this kind of resurgence of long-form writing, even though you think of Tumblr as a very visual, short-form platform. Um, but there's all these sites sprouting up that are featuring long-form writing, and, and even, you know, you're seeing sites like BuzzFeed hire for long-form editors. So it's been kind of an interesting twist in the idea that people have really short attention spans, and, you know, it's like all these teenagers on Tumblr who just want to look at GIFs of, Cumberbatch, but actually they want <laughs> substantive journalism as well. <laughs> right, absolutely. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's even one thing I thought that was really interesting is um, Twitter recently announced they're doing, like, a fiction festival, and they, yeah, they seem to have a whole long-form community as well, which is so interesting considering, you know, the 140-character constraint. I, yeah, I just find that fascinating that, you know, people still have a want for that type of really quality content. Like, they will continue to read something in longer form, which is really cool. Um, but I, I really want to touch more on your point about how Tumblr doesn't have ads. And I think that this is similar for how the content on Link LinkedIn works, too. So you're able to experiment a lot because, you know, you have just like so much freedom and don't have those constraints of you know like the clicks and and how you're going to monetize so what what do you think that that means for this future of publishing on social networks and you know do you think that it's always going to be that way or will there come a point where it's going to go back to kind of similar models of what we're seeing in traditional media being reliant on ads Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think that um, there's a couple ways I'd look at this. Number one, the, the, um, we're a little bit. You know, LinkedIn has a has a different, a very different business model. We have advertising as a part of the business model, but it's also there's other there's two other legs to, uh, to LinkedIn. LinkedIn isn't necessarily supported. Doesn't need to have ads supporting this content. The whole idea is engagement. What will bring people back? It's like, to have them engage more. That's what we're really looking for. And when you have that as your model, what you really care about is high quality content. And so it's, it's incredibly liberating um, as a former journalist to have that as a, you know, to, to not have that, that issue weighing on you of, you know, how are we going to monetize this? How are we going to monetize this? You just don't, you're just thinking, how can we make something amazing? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that for most of my years when, when I was in journalism, we were thinking that. Um, there were times, though, when things got very bad, and you you had to you had to start thinking more and more about monetization. You can see it everywhere. Um, uh, one of the you know, but but I think that all every media company, whether it's a social media company or a traditional media company, one of the things that everyone is is realizing now is that banner ads, um, you know, display ads are not what are not necessarily the future. A part of the future, maybe, but not the future. And everyone's trying to figure out conversational marketing. And Jess talked a little bit about BuzzFeed, which I think has done a great job with this. Um, mm -hmm. And what you're seeing at LinkedIn is something really similar, where we have managed groups. Um, these are groups that are that are packaged around t particular topics. Um, something like professional women. We have one called professional, the the Connect group for uh, Network for Professional Women. It's sponsored by Citibank. City comes in, they talk with the women in this group, about 70,000 people, it's very focused, it is, there's original content in the forms of new conversations, there's influencer copy that's going in there, there are stories that are coming out of it where people like Forbes or AOL Jobs are finding art, interesting articles to take from this, um, from this group, mm -hmm. and City sponsors the whole thing. You know, this is, this is the way that, this is the, another way of monetizing content, and I think that what we are, that what you're seeing from, from Tumblr and from LinkedIn and from others is we're all figuring this out. You know, the old walls are falling down between what separated one type of media company from a different type of media company, and we are, I think, all crafting the future together now. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Sure. That's totally right, and I think that that's what we have to do is break down the walls. I mean, we try really hard to collaborate with other outlets, and so. For us, it's not about kind of hoarding our content and not wanting it to be shared. I mean, Tumblr is all about sharing, and so as many people who want to share our content, even if it doesn't always have the right attribution, is is all the better. Um, and so, like today on the piece that we put out, we partnered with the Daily Beast, and so they ran the piece on their site as well. We've done that with New York Magazine, with NPR, with MTV News with sites like that where in most cases we're producing the content here and we're funding it but we're allowing them to also publish it. Um, and so I think it's really about just spreading the work and and at a time when journalism companies are you know really struggling and you know, last week Newsweek it was announced they're not publishing anymore that was my <laughs> that's my former employer. Um, yeah. So, so to be at a place where the tech company is actually funding you to do quality journalism and 
you know, tech companies have money, as a journalist who is kind of used to being in the, you know, like I used to sleep on couches when I would go report stories because we didn't have any money for a hotel and I would have to like really convince my editors that it was worth spending the money for the flight out to wherever it was. So it's really nice and encouraging to be at a place that still cares about content but isn't so worried about monetizing strictly the editorial content. Um, you know, yeah. Tumblr, you can have ads and I can talk a bit about that as well, but but Storyboard and our editorial arm does not host ads. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you make good points in terms of the tech companies, you know, have the funds to do this and the creativity and the drive, but they also have the perfect platforms. I mean, they have huge audiences. They understand these audiences and what's going to appeal to them, you know, more or less. Um, so, I, you know, I know Eric joined us from the community. Um, Eric, I'd love to bring you into the conversation if you have a question for Dan and Jessica. Um, well, right now I'm just kind of listening in and sort of again catching up a little bit of uh, on what I've been a huge fan of uh, Mashable, so it's awesome when you guys have a hangout and I can uh, jump in. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm just listening for now. I think um, uh, I'm I'm not so sure uh, where the other people are from in terms of this hangout, but uh, okay. I guess uh, I'm I'm just kind of curious in terms of. Uh, if th maybe this is already discussed, is uh, for social networks, um, the media companies of the future. Uh, that's interesting to me. Um, is that basically a question asking that people are going to be uh, looking to social media for their media now instead of uh, individual media sources? Is that kind of the general direction this is going? Yeah, I think that's mostly what we're talking about. And I don't like, you know, Dan Jeskal to ask that million dollar question. Do you think that, you know, these are going to be the new destinations for news and information? Well, you know, I think that one of the, it's a great question. And um, one of the things that we saw with, with LinkedIn today, which is a social business news product, is that, it, or, or the idea behind it when it was initially launched, um, was that people want, that there is more news than ever. There is, there, there is so much to read and to, to try to consume. Yeah. Um, if you can give people the right news in the right place, then you're doing them an incredible service. So the way LinkedIn today works is we have news coming in from a million different sources. We are, we explained this earlier, but we're using algorithms and editorial efforts to try to get the right news. Um, and then we link out. So we will send people from LinkedIn to the publisher sites. And that's an important reason. It's an important distinction between what we're doing and what other um, aggregators might do, because we're not trying to keep people locked in. What we want them to do is find if if the the right way for them to get their news is to start on LinkedIn, and then to end up on um, the New York Times and spend the rest of their day in the New York Times. That's great. Or Med City News, or you know any other, uh, or, or someone's individual blog. That's perfect. If we can, so, so I think that what you're seeing with social media companies is a lot of them say, start with us, finish somewhere else. No problem. Just come back and see what else we have to offer. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, I think we're kind of already seeing this happening. Um, I mean, I almost like to think that we're in like a post tech world where you're really looking to sharing um, to get your news. I mean, I don't really. It's rare that I go to all the different blogs and sites that I used to read on a daily basis individually these days. You know, I trust what my friends on Facebook are sharing or what my LinkedIn connections are sharing or what the people in my Tumblr dashboard are sharing. And I'm still getting the same kinds of news because I'm deciding who to follow and who to connect to. But it's all there in one place. So I think the idea of sharing news is really kind of what we're looking towards in the future. and. And like Dan said, not necessarily keeping people on the platform that they start on, but being able to point them to different spots where they might want to check out from your platform. Yeah, I loved uh, I loved the uh, the LinkedIn today. It's uh, definitely one of the cooler features that LinkedIn has. Uh, I'm still I'm still getting used to the the whole idea of updating stuff on LinkedIn. Um, and maybe Dan, I guess maybe for a topic for another time. But I'm not so sure as as a, either a community manager, which I am, or uh, as just a regular LinkedIn user, like how you know what I'm, what I should be sharing on LinkedIn. Because for me, honestly, before the only time I go on LinkedIn now is for 
when I'm searching for a new job, <laughs> which is bad because again, my CEO will see that I'm, I'm making changes and stuff, and that's fine, it's whatever. But like, um, but that I really enjoyed LinkedIn today, and so I can see where you're kind of moving in for that. But for me, it's just a little unclear in terms of okay, what do I share? Obviously, not you know fraught pictures from last night, but I can share. A, yeah, so I don't really you know. know. It's, it's, it's a great question, <laughs> and it relates really to what we were. You definitely don't share those pictures. Okay? <laughs> it, and it relates uh, a lot to what we just launched with the influencer program where we have these thought leaders writing on LinkedIn. Um, one of the things that made a lot of them feel very comfortable about the idea of writing on LinkedIn was that the comments were not going to fill up with exactly what you're talking about. The comments on LinkedIn are never, um, you know, just, Flame, flame wars. There's no trolling that goes on on LinkedIn. And it's because everyone's identity is tied to what they're saying. There's no anonymity on LinkedIn. When you post something, if you want to post a comment, you have to do it with your professional identity, which means your boss sees it, your employees see it, someone you want to work for one day or partner with, or you know, uh, someone who's going to make you your next fortune, they see it. You're always being, it, it is so tied to your professional identity that it helps keep people very focused on what they're going to say, making, thinking about how they say it, and it means that when you do post on LinkedIn, you're usually posting about something that has to do with work. There's never, I mean, your, your question, I think, is how do you, what do you post on there, but you basically know the contours of what you're going to post on there. You're not going to post the frat pictures. You're not going to post the party stuff. You don't post pictures of your kids. If it's about work and you want to seem smart, it's about community management. It's about whatever it is you just read that's helped you do better work and you want to share it with your community, you post it on there. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, I know um, I know we have to wrap up pretty soon. So, Dan and Jessica, if there's anything else you want to add about the topic, I'd love for you to, you know, give a closing statement of of sorts. Um. Well, uh, check out storyboard.tumblr. <laughs> and I just think that we, you know tough times for journalists and for news like we have to figure out new ways to think about this and to collaborate and like you know us working with a site like LinkedIn or working with mainstream outlets I really think is the best way to go about this and and there was there was so long at Newsweek where we would hoard content for the print magazine and like clearly as we learned last week now that we know that the print magazine will no longer publish that is not going to work so collaboration that's yeah. great. Uh, I would definitely agree with what Jess said. I think that the, the um, and also I love the idea of doing a plug. Certainly come to, go to LinkedIn.com, check out uh, all <laughs> the great news and, uh, and views pouring through there. Um, the, I think that the, the, the important takeaway here is that um, is I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of, of media companies. I think they're going to look a lot different in five years, but I think what we've seen on LinkedIn and anywhere else I've worked, and it happens more and more every day, is that people are desperate to read really great information. They want to know what's going on in the world. Um, they cannot get enough of great news and great views. So I, I'm, I, am, I am a complete optimist about, about uh, where long form and short form journalism goes. I think that you're, you're getting more and more high quality content. Um, the business models obviously still are working themselves out, but as a consumer, we've never had it better. Yeah. Excellent. No, oh, this has been great, and you know, Jessica and Dan, thank you both, and Eric, thanks for hopping in as well. Um, this has been awesome, and really looking forward to digging into this more at our media summit panel next week. Um, yeah, folks tuning in, if you're interested in attending the Media Summit, you can get tickets at mashable.com slash Media Summit, and we'll hope to see you there. And uh, Jessica and Dan, I'll see you next week to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Have a good you. one. Bye.